I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk today. It's a fairly broad topic and to keep to time, I'm going to really highlight some of the important issues on follow-up and management of a patient who's undergone a mitral valve procedure. Um, there will be others who are going to talk specifically about repair versus replacement. Uh, in the last decade, I think um, there's really been a sea change. So many of us in this room would have known the time when a mobile phone looked like a brick and was just a mobile phone, to today when we've got the slick device, which among 50 other functions is also a phone, or when kids uh, thought they were having fun when they were reading books. Uh, whereas now it's more uh, electronic gadgets and devices that provides that same pleasure. And there's really been a sea change when we look at how mitral valve disease has changed. And for people who are following up these patients, it's really important to recognize some of these things. So we started off with prosthetic and bioprosthetic valves. We then moved on to repairs. Is it a total annuloplasty ring, partial annuloplasty ring? And very soon, we're going to have percutaneous repair as well, whether it be done by surgeons who can learn things in six months or interventional cardiologists. We will <laughs> wait and see. Uh, I think the three points I wanted to sort of uh, highlight is that we have a much better understanding of the natural history of mitral regurgitation now. There is a major shift in etiology. We're not dealing with rheumatic heart disease and mixed mitral valve disease. What we're dealing with more is pure mitral degenerative disease or myxomatous disease. And there's certainly been improvements in operative techniques, improvements and changes. Uh, what do we know about the natural history? And I don't want to spend too much time, but it's 20 years now since we know that if you leave mitral regurgitation and try to treat it medically, you're going to have more morbidity. And really, after a time, almost everyone needs to have surgery. And as was highlighted, you are jeopardizing a patient from having a simple repair to a much more complex procedure by just watchful waiting. And the same data were reinforced uh, by a uh, recent study from Enric Serrano and the Mayo Clinic, where they looked at the effect of regurgitant orifice area um, related to mitral regurgitation. And once again, they showed that all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, as well as other cardiac events, were much higher in patients with worse degrees of MR and if you just treated them medically or watchfully waited. So significant MR needs to be fixed. There are more techniques and more procedures, but they all need long-term comprehensive evaluation. And to think of follow-up in a sort of comprehensive way, we have to look at the functional status. We've got to look at sort of hard events of adverse outcomes. And in terms of echocardiographic follow-up, we want to consider recurrence of mitral regurgitation, are there procedure-specific valve complications, what's the left ventricle doing, and then, of course, um, mortality. If we look at functional status, I guess the simple things that we can easily do is a six-minute walk test, assess their NYHA class, and quality of life scores. Um, some of those performers got 36 pages when they have to have something that's a bit more user-friendly. When I looked at the literature, there are no specific results on cardiac rehabilitation with valve disease uh, specifically, and really data is extrapolated from heart failure and coronary artery disease patients going to rehab. There is an ongoing prospective study, the Copenhagen Heart Valve Study, and they're hoping to randomize patients to a specific treatment um, of exercise training over 12 weeks with some psychoeducational therapies. Small studies, not randomized observational data does suggest that there's improvement in exercise tolerance, improvement in VO2 max, as well as quality of life. And 
really am amongst all of these other things, we need to bring in cardiac rehabilitation as well into this heart team that we're trying to develop. If we look at heart endpoints, and I'm really only going to look at rhythm, particularly atrial fibrillation, um, there's a range in terms of how frequently you see it. But what we do know is that after a cardiothoracic procedure, at least a third of patients may develop postoperative atrial fibrillation. The data suggests that if you have a combined procedure, valve plus bypass operation, this incidence goes up. And that post-op AF, the incidence increases. I mean, it's just logical in the older patients, if they're male, if they've had preoperative paroxysmal AF, and if they've got an increased left atrial size. What's important, though, is that there are data now showing that the occurrence of postoperative atrial fibrillation is not just a, a non-malignant thing, and it's not just, oh, we see it, you know, we've just tampered with the heart, and therefore it's there, but that there is actually an association with increased morbidity and mortality. This is a fairly old study, almost a decade ago from the Mayo Clinic again, because they seem to have the volume to do this sort of a thing. Uh, almost 800 patients, no one had a history of atrial fibrillation. Um, and they either had repair or replacement. They reported a 24% incidence of atrial fibrillation. And they said it was either early, if it occurred in the first two weeks postoperatively, or late, if it was happening later. And when they followed these patients, there was an increased incidence of stroke and heart failure. The two things that they identified was the left atrial size. So if you're dealing with a very enlarged left atrium, you've left the regurgitation for too long, you're more likely to see atrial fibrillation. And if you see early post-op AF, they had almost a five-fold increase in developing late atrial fibrillation. So we do really, when we're following up these patients, need to look at that post-op report, uh, the discharge summary, and see how many had atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is data from um, the group in Leiden in the Netherlands, where they looked at mitral valve repair early in asymptomatic patients. The left atrium was already remodeled. They used three-dimensional echo to look at the left atrial volume. But in successful early repair, what this group showed was that by six months, and certainly by 12 months, the left atrium had undergone reverse remodeling, and it was similar to controls. And they concluded that if you did it early, maybe you might minimize how much atrial fibrillation patients would develop later on. Other rhythm disturbances, um, this is just a brief case, a 55-year-old gentleman with severe mitral regurgitation from posterior leaflet prolapse who proceeded to mitral valve repair and annuloplasty, and the intraop tour report said he just had trivial to one plus, so everything went well. But at six-week follow-up, when I saw him, he said, I don't know why you sent me for this. I just feel really horrible. I felt much better when my valve was leaky. And when I felt his pulse, it was 40, and his ECG showed that, uh, complete heart block. And when we look at the literature, there is um, a report of uh, a group of patients who can develop heart block, complete heart block, with the use of pacemakers in up to 3%. I'm sure this data would be different based on centers, but it is something to consider. And it seems to be more common in the patient who is reoperated or has preoperative atrial fibrillation. Now, moving on more to the echocardiographic follow up, which I'll limit just uh, to recurrence of mitral regurgitation, procedure specific valve complications, and left ventricular dysfunction. So, whether the valve has been repaired or replaced, we really have to look for recurrence of mitral regurgitation. This is with biprosthetic valves or repairs mainly. Is there paravalvular leak? Is it also having other problems causing hemolysis? Is there functional mitral stenosis? Uh, and of course, complications like infections, endocarditis, thrombosis, 
specific to prosthetic valves. So on the transthoracic echo, I think with two-dimensional examination, if it's a prosthetic valve, you need to know the structure uh, and how are there specific characteristics, what about chamber size and function. With Doppler examination, we need to measure hemodynamics, we need to assess for regurgitation, we need to look at right heart pressures, and in certain cases, we may need to do transesophageal echocardiography, and the patient needs to have a tool to better understand what's happening to that valve that's being worked on. So we do know, need to know the original etiology. What was the procedure? Was it a replacement? Was it a repair? Was it with or without caudal steering? We're now going to perhaps see percutaneous repair, annuloplasty rings. How, how many of us know enough about what annuloplasty ring went in? Or, you know, the type of prosthetic valve, I think we've all been taught to appreciate. Now, what are some of the facts we need to know about repair versus replacement? The detail, I'm sure, is going to be covered in detail by people who know much more about this than myself. But simplistically, with repair, you're preserving the left ventricular geometry better, and you tend to have more physiological left ventricular function. The disadvantage, though, seems to be its dur durability, and that there seems to be more recurrence. But I'm sure with newer techniques, um, you're seeing less of that. But as has been highlighted, it needs to go to a high volume center for you to be able to extrapolate, you know, the, the less than 5% recurrence as quoted by centers like the Mayo. Now, this was uh, a recent paper. It's not um, from myxomatous valve disease, where we know repairs are what's uh, really good for patients, but this was ischemic MR. And this was looking at repair versus replacement in about 250 patients. But they did the new replacement, the caudal sparing replacement. And you can see here that in both groups, at 6 and 12 months, there was significant and comparable reduction in MR, and mortality rates were similar. And they showed that MACE events and death was roughly the same. But what they reported was that in the repair group, there was significant recurrence of mitral regurgitation. And I know that percentage is very high, but it is ischemic MR as opposed to functional MR. Now, just moving gears a little bit with prosthetic valves, they've been around a long time, so we know we have to think of the type, the size, be familiar with structure and function. We use multiple planes for assessment because of shadowing. Uh, we use simple cues like prominent opening valve clicks and closure clicks to say this valve is functioning all right. I must remind you of the use of just simple fluoroscopy if you can't sort of see an occluder motion. It, it tells you all very easily. And we have developed patterns. If that's that bileaflet valve, I know Michael just said, don't put in a prosthetic valve. It's the worst thing. But we still have patients who get them, and we see them in follow-up, but we know typical patterns. We know with prosthetic valve assessment, we need to know the type, we need to know the size, we need to know what is the expected orifice area, what is the expected gradient. We know about pre patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, we can derive an indexed effective orifice area. We have cutoffs. So all of this has been quite well studied. There is um, the use of a mitral valve index because one of the major limitations, particularly when we use prosthetic valves, is shadowing. And we can't, as you can see in the panel here, clearly visualize the regurgence in jet. So you can do a ratio between the VTI of the mitral valve and the VTI of the LVOT. So a bit similar to the dimensionless index, or the DI that we use for the aortic valve. And a normal mitral index is less than 2.2. And Daryl Burstow and colleagues in Prince Charles presented this a few years ago, where if the mitral valve index was abnormal, they went on and looked at the pressure half-time to determine whether the valve was getting stenotic 
or whether it was actually valvular regurgitation. So if your pressure half-time is short, you're more likely to have regurgitation, whereas if the pressure half-time is long, you're more likely to have stenose that valve. Now, in just a high output state, you can see a high gradient. But in a high output state, your mitral valve index is not going to be raised. How about mitral valve repair? I think this is where we have a problem. We lack systemic, uh, systemic data that's been collected. There's a range of annuloplasty rings. We don't know anything about what are expected mean gradients. There are different types of repair. There are varying amounts of leaflet resection. And we lack that data to know, is this really normal or is this abnormal? And certainly when we work in these teams, this becomes an important aspect, I believe, in follow-up of these patients. For a group of patients who've had a previous mitral repair, we may need to do a transesophageal echo. And this is to further and better evaluate recurrence or paravalvular leak. Certainly, if you're suspecting endocarditis or with prosthetic valves, mitral valve thrombosis. Jason showed amazing pictures on 3D uh, in the pre-op workup. And I think 3D is not just pretty pictures, as he showed. It can enhance assessment. Um, we're certainly struggling there because we don't have enough horsepower to generate good color images. But certainly in the future, as technology improves, I'm sure that's where we're heading. I'd just like to show you some case examples of follow-up of patients. So this was a 35-year-old man from a correctional center who had had a mitral valve procedure 24 months ago. It was a bioprosthetic uh, replacement. He was afebrile but had increasing shortness of breath and a very loud systolic murmur. This was his transthoracic echo. I'd like to highlight here how much shadowing there is um, because the beam's coming through here. But if you have a look here on the ventricular surface, you can see a Pisa dome. And this is quite large and suggests that the degree of regurgitation is quite significant. It's also not coming through the middle of that valve and it's looking like it's paravalvular. When you go to the apical um, long axis view, we're almost totally shadowed out. And, you know, it's just a question of guesstimating how much MR there is. But once again, if you look at the Pisa dome, you would think that this is fairly significant um, paravalvular regurgitation. This is confirmed on a transesophageal echo. And because we're not lining up where we're seeing the shadow of the jet, we can appreciate the degree of regurgitation. And in this particular patient, we also see this rocking of the valve, which suggests that there's actually dehiscence in one part of the annulus. Another case, um, a young lady, a migrant from Cambodia, who just knew she had some heart operation. She did have a mitral valve uh, replacement at age 20. She was eight weeks pregnant. She had undergone um, IVF treatment. And the warfarin was seized prior to IVF um, treatments. She was switched to clexane. She presented with increasing shortness of breath and orthopnea and reduced exercise tolerance. This was her transthoracic echo. And straight up from this, you can see that this valve looks very abnormal. Um, but we don't see significant regurgitation, a lot of aliasing into the valve. Apical four-chamber view, again, a lot of aliasing. Again, the Pisa dome becoming very useful. We're seeing it on the left atrial side instead of the left ventricular side and suggesting that this valve is looking stenosed. And when we do a CW, that was her mean gradient, 28. Uh, so she went off to have an uh, urgent transesophageal echo. You can see here chunks of uh, thrombus, one occluder not moving. Just a tip that um, Randy Martin once presented at the meeting, you watch this shadow line, and when you see it moving, you know that occluder is moving, and you can see only one shadow move, and the other one is sort of stationary. And uh, when you look at the left atrial appendage, that's full of clot as well. 
And a 3D echo is certainly showing only one occluder moving and this great chunky bit of uh, thrombus over this valve. Now, a more common case of mitral valve obstruction is, of course, Panis syndrome. And um, it's really difficult sometimes on 2D echo to say this is Panis versus something else. But you really have to look at the timeline. So if it's something acute, like I showed you in the last lady, it's more likely to be thrombotic. But when you've been following this patient over years, if you slowly see that gradient creeping up, it could be panis. So it is important to look at the gradient across that valve. You need to consider patient prosthesis mismatch, less common for the mitral valve, panis formation, thrombus if it's a prosthetic valve, degeneration if it's a bioprosthetic valve. And with mitral valve repair, there is an expected amount of increase in mitral valve gradient post-repair. So it appears to be that uh, posterior leaflet plication and the amount of leaflet res restriction, the extent of myxomatous disease, so if it involves more than one scholar, you're more likely to have an increased gradient across the mitral valve after repair. It seems to be more common with a complete annuloplasty ring rather than the partial, more with rigid. Uh, what is interesting is it is important, and there was one study that I could find where they looked at patients post mitral valve repair and they exercised these patients. So they divided them into those who had a raised gradient, which was more than 10 millimeters, and those who had less than 10 millimeters. And in the group that had an increased gradient, there was actually an increase in pulmonary artery pressures, lower exercise um, time, higher BNP, and a larger index left atrial volume. The development of the so-called functional mitral stenosis can be very early after repair, where it's attributed to the actual repair procedure, or it could happen down the track and could be just from degeneration and excessive fibrous tissue formation. Two other 3D pictures very quickly. This is just to show you a paravalvular uh, dehiscence and, of course, vegetation. Um, so 3D can help when you're assessing these valves. The last thing to look at is left ventricular function and um, post mitral valve procedure, this is important. We need to look at the chamber volumes and the left ventricular in systolic volume indexed has been shown to correlate with clinical outcomes, hospitalization and survival. We've got a whole new range of technologies, including strain and strain rate. I'm not going there, but they're all meant to be very helpful in predicting who will develop poor left ventricular function. Um, again, work from Enrique Serrano showing that the, if you have a low preoperative ejection fraction, and by low I mean near normal, 50 to 59%, you still have worse survival postoperatively. And I think that just highlights the fact that we may need to be more proactive in getting these patients sent to have their mitral valve fixed. So this was a large retrospective series from um, uh, Rakesh Suri at the Mayo Clinic, looking at about 1,000 patients. The vast majority, 900, had mitral valve repair. And um, basically, they wanted to look at factors which could affect post-operative left ventricular ejection fraction. And the factors that come out are left ventricular geometry function, whether they have um, had previous myocardial infarction. Certainly, left ventricular ejection fraction is better preserved when you have a repair versus a replacement. And the decade of surgery. So the more recent group who had surgery in the 90s had better left ventricular ejection fraction. So when we see someone with poor LBEF, I think we have to look at that pre-op report and see what was their EF what were their LV dimensions? Is this something that's happened after the surgical intervention or is this something which was pre-existing? 
So in summary now, recommendations for echocardiographic assessment, certainly transthoracic echo should be able to cover the vast majority. We need to look at chambers, the left ventricle, the left atrium. We need to look at the mitral valve. We need to assess the gradient across the mitral valve. If it's a prosthetic valve, we need to look at the effective orifice area. With repair, we may need to devi device and derive better cutoffs for gradients. And then we need to determine whether there's recurrence of regurgitation or whether there's paravalvular leak. We also need to assess the pulmonary artery systolic pressure and right ventricular function. And when in doubt, when symptoms are disproportionate to your findings on a resting transthoracic echo, it may be very beneficial to do an exercise echo, measure the gradient after the exercise, measure the pulmonary pressure after exercise. Suggested timing. I think every patient who's had a mitral valve procedure should have a baseline study to say what is their status after their procedure. Very often it's done pre-discharge and you know patients are uncomfortable, they can't uh, uh, lie down if it's not minimally invasive, you have problems with scar. And really the one month mark is often a good time to assess the patient and to assess the gradient, to assess left ventricular function. The next time, perhaps one year after, and after that, um, I would be guided by the appropriateness use criteria. So post mitral valve repair, they recommend regular routine surveillance after about three years. That uh, time frame may be extended as we get better with doing mitral valve repair. Uh, routine surveillance uh, post bioprosthetic mitral valves should happen after three to five years because that's when they start to degenerate. And certainly if the patient's symptom changes, it warrants uh, evaluation. So in conclusion then, uh, the prevalence of mitral regurgitation is increasing. The options and approaches are increasing. So also the types of intervention, all patients require routine follow-up. We really need to have um, better guidelines post-repair, post-mitral uh, clip. We're going to see a sea of different uh, interventions being performed. Patients need to be evaluated comprehensively, their functional parameters, rhythm, and of course, echocardiographic ass assessment. Thanks for your attention.